Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. So guess what, everybody? We're back in uh, Shemot again. Right. Okay, okay. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. You remember when we was there like... Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So guess what? We're, we're back. We're back. We're back. We're back. We're back. We're back. <coughs> okay. um, so from last week, right? Did anybody... Did anybody look more into the uh, the Hebrew word um and going? Remember we talked about that last week? Mm-hmm. What did we talk about specifically about those two words? Um and goy. Um wasn't it that um goy was like say like the Gentiles or any other nation aside from Israel? And um was just to say people. <coughs> Go ahead, back here. Just any people, any people with time? Uh, that might be over. It sounds like that might have been a little familiar. Not quite. But, <coughs> go ahead. Go is a multi dimensional word from what I study about it. it okay. Means, and it means uh, uh, nations or uh, a nation. So, go ahead for me, nations of people. Or it could just mean one nation of people. Uh, uh, I'm meaning a people. Uh, uh, so, from a Hebrew perspective, I'm, when you're speaking of I'm, you're speaking of your people. Or when you say the people of, you're speaking of a people of somebody else. So, I'm is, is basically in the Hebrew language meaning people. <coughs> A nation of people are saying it's going. Family, kinfolk. Family, kinfolk, yeah. Right? Generation, uh, uh, and that sort. Okay. Um, what else did we talk about for last week? Oh. Oh, go ahead, Adam. Um, we talked about, um, as far as um, Jacob's passing. Um, he's um, passing out a blessing to um, Joseph's sons, Menashe, and um, Ephraim. And Ephraim. And Ephraim. And um, he, he, when he went to give him the blessing, he put it on Menashe's head. Menashe was the oldest one, right? Yeah. Menashe was the oldest and he, he wanted to put it, his hand on Manasseh's head, but he put it on the triumph, but he said the triumph was going to be more <coughs> mightier than his brother. And um, that's what we also learned about, more about um, what the hand under the thigh means, about the promise and keeping the vow, and, um, and the different situations, the 12 brothers, the different um, characteristics of the 12 brothers. Yeah. Um, so remember, um, when we were talking about the uh, the blessing in uh, chapter 48, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we were talking about how um, the passing along of, you know, essentially putting the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob onto the other children, that, that makes that, you know, very, very interpersonal for the family, right? And as we got further down into the chapter, um, it talks about uh, <clears throat> um, Jacob is talking to Yosef, and he says that uh, you know he too will become a people, right? And he too will become great. Yet his younger brother uh, shall become greater than he is, and his offsprings uh, will fill the nation. All right? Got a question? No, no, let me just go I just want to expound on what he, what he was saying. That's, that's it. So well, let me finish. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, was trying to maintain an, a, a, a heritage or an understanding of, 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 of traditions that wasn't so necessarily there. Yosef was trying to give the elder, which we try to do now, we give the elder the inheritance of the birthright. But it hadn't been so since the birth of Yishkak. The younger received 
the inheritance of the blessing. It was it was Yishkak, and then it was Yaakov, and all of them was the younger of the of the born. So, but 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 Yaakov seen being blind, how yours have set him in position and switched his hands. And as far as the, uh, the under the thigh we talk about, that's more or less uh, uh, making a promise on your seed, on your lawns, on, on, on what comes next out of you. So what we were talking about with that, right, is that, you know, we, if we thought about and, uh, you know, perhaps maybe understood better, um, really the weightiness of the things that proceed from, you know, our mouths, uh, and the way that they render oaths um, culturally during that time, you know, maybe we would, you know, think critically about some of the things that we kind of say loosely, you know, amongst the nation. So, you know, like speaking wasn't just a, you know, a, you know, a thing to do, you know, just kind of loosely. You, you know what I mean? And we gave some, you know, some different examples of, you know, how, you know, words really have an impact. And you know, given the 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 weightiness of of the uh, of binding an oath um, to something like posterity, you know, that's a very 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 big deal. Right? Okay. Anything else from last week? Let's go to uh, Shemot. All right. Shemot, Parashat Shemot, chapter 1. <clears throat> and we're going to start at verse 1. Israel, who came to Mitzrayim with Yaakov, each one with his household. Reuben, Shimeon, Lewi, Yehuda, Yisachar, Zebulon, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, God, Ashir, and all those who were descendants of Yaakov were seventy beings, as Yosef was already in Mitzrayim. And Yosef died, and all his brothers and all that generation. And Benai Israel bore fruit and increased very much, multiplied and became very strong, and the land was filled with them. Then a new sovereign arose over Mitzrayim who did not know Yosef. And he said to his people, see the people of the children of Israel are more and stronger than we. Come, let us act wisely toward them Least they increase, and it shall be that when fighting befalls us, that they shall join our enemies and fight against us, and shall go up out of the land. So that they say, so they set slave masters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Paro supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they increased and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. And the Mitzrites made the children of Israel serve with harshness. All right. All right. So what's, uh, what's taking place, right? So remember, we go from a famine that's taking place in the land of Mitzrayim, right? Uh, Yosef is pretty much uh, next to the throne. Well, he's only second to the throne in Egypt. That's correct, right? Okay. Um, what has taken place to where, you know, you pretty much have, I guess you could call it a unified kingdom in the known region at that time to this current dispensation of time where there's, there's a new king, right, who raises up the Mitzrayim and 
He doesn't know Yosef. Doesn't know anything about you know uh, the veracity of that family, right? For them, or for Mitch Ryan to take his position against the offspring of uh, of Israel and you know the family that came from Yosef. So what's like? What's going on? That's a question. That's a question. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. All right. Now, we're not going to talk about the king that arrived because we don't know a lot about him. Okay. Okay. But what the scripture does, to, like Baruch was talking about earlier, the writer's trying to convey a message. We know that they're in uh, 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 Goshen, that, that the land was given to Goshen. So when they say the land was filled with them, now, are we talking about Goshen? Are we talking about all of Mizraim was filled with them? Because you got to realize that, that even though they were sheep herders, not all of them grew up to be sheep herders. Some of them have to grow up to be other things. And there was like in a relationship at this point with Israel because of Joseph. Because Joseph was Pharaoh over the land, he was second in command, and the people had to respect the people as well. So now the book say the land was filled with. Now we ain't talking about a little section of the land that makes this king say, oh, these people are great and mighty enough, they, they just barely grow. These people don't know what took. In my mind, Mizraim and the king say, this deal with them because they are strong than we are. Okay. Go ahead, Aki. Weren't the um, people who came in known as the Hyksos, the, um, these, these Egyptians that came in with this, this dispensation of time to where basically like the Pharaoh that came in, like he didn't know anything about the hierarchy of the Pharaohs and everything like that. He didn't know Joseph and when they, if you were to mention Joseph's name, he wouldn't really care because it's like that has nothing to do with them. So it was like a revolution that came and like kind of took place. A lot of people suggest that, you know, maybe this is the, the time of the Hyksos period. Mm -hmm. um, anybody know what Hyksos means? Is it seed? No, no, not, not seed people. Hyksos means uh, rulers of foreign lands. Okay, so hence the, the phrase that you might read in the Tanakh, uh, a new king arose in Mitzrayim, right? Uh, Paro is not the actual name of the individual, right? It's a title. Everybody understand that? Okay. So, you know, you can get a whole different mindset, you know, attached to this title of Paro. Everybody follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, so, a lot of, uh, I'm just going to say, literature um, suggests that this time, uh, after Yosef, you know, probably was the Hicksos period. Um, which could suggest why things are so different. Okay. All right. Uh, but still, in the same likewise, you know, how does that happen, you know, if the known region at that time has, you know, basically come off a, uh, a period of time where the land was pretty good, right? It was it was sustained because of the of the works of Yosef. So what were they doing? Meaning the children of Israel. What were they doing? They were being successful. Mm -hmm. And in in a sense, when when someone is grow mighty, they become strong. They you know you see it through their works, through their actions. Um, at the time when they first came in, they were seventy soldiers. So you know they had to marry, they had to have kids, and eventually. They also had to have sustained. Israel has always been known to be agricultural people. So, you know, their farm, their crops. Jacob was very mighty in his field. So you can see that they had a established something that made them fear their success or their, their wealth in a sense. <clears throat> Especially when the land was not theirs. Okay. So. Shabbat Shalom, Kim. Shabbat Shalom, Lekha. I want to I wanna go with what my brother just said and, and kind of address the other um, question that you had. In the success of the nation of Yisrael and how we were growing, establishing ourselves, um, there comes a comfort zone and you, and you get, you, you, you find yourself um, doing the things that are, are, are showing you um, your productivity. So when you think about um, Yosef and all the brothers dying off and um, that that Pharaoh of that time not being the same one at this time, as my Bain said, now 
you're getting a new new atmosphere. It makes me think about um, like at, at your at your place of uh, employment. Um, I, 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 a new acquisition means that there's going to be new rules. The things that you are comfortable with doing at work, uh, the new person that comes in is like, okay, yeah, that was fine, but this is what we do. And so now a lot of your rules and regulations that you are used to, they get thrown out the window. Now you have to redevelop your train of thought. So now you're looking at someone that doesn't know the people of this land and sees how many of them, we, very much like how we are today. They get scared, they get nervous, so now they want to find a way to control that which they're uh, scared of. Once again, I parallel that to, to today. The way we get treated is because they're scared of who we are as a people. They're scared of us in darkness. So they're going to be petrified as we are slowly but surely coming to the reality of truth. So um, that it, your question was kind of a twofold. And um, I just I wanted to address it from both those angles because it is a lot going on right now. I think that Yisrael, once again, was just comfortable at their success um, at what they were doing. So now you have someone coming in, changing the rules to the game. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have to adapt as they see. Right. In order for a new king to move in, or a king that did not know Joseph, or a king that did not know the Israelites, it has to be somebody from the outside, as you see. You said so, be somebody that from the outside, right? Yeah, like you see. So it means, so it means, in order for a new king to come in, you either have to bring him in, or you have to copy him, one way or the other. Now you got to see Yah's moving, Yah's hand moving through all of this. When he said to Abraham, "I'm going to take you into this place, and then the fourth generation will bring out my nation." So now Yah's moving because your people is growing. It's growing at a rate. Of un that we that people are normally that other nations don't move at. Right, right. You understand? So my children may be having twins and triplets, right, yeah. and their children may be having twins and triplets, and they and they, they just they just filling the land up. But when I hear the words, all of Miss Ryan was filled, the whole land was filled. This new king comes in and says, and says, we can't control these people. There's too many of them in this land. Now, whether he talked to this land or not, or how he took this land, or how he got this land, he feels as though his control or his authority is in jeopardy because of that. Mm -hmm. So, you got to watch out how Yah moves through this whole story. It is Yah that's moving that the people, even the people, the people might not recognize what they're doing. You understand? They're just going by life every day. Just like when the United States, we just go by life every day. But then stuff starts happening, and we don't really see it. That's why most have to go out in the wilderness to come back and see what y'all see, but we ain't there yet. So, so, so now, so now, so now the people is growing, and Pharaoh is watching these people grow and multiply, and watching Israel grow and multiply. And it's not because of nothing that we doing; it's because of what the Most High is doing. Okay. So, um, it says in here um, uh, <clears throat> that the Torah and enslaved the children of Israel. Uh, with uh, with harshness, pedic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, pedic means to uh, to fracture. Um, means to uh, to break, right? So you ever seen like how? Uh, and this might, you know, I'm just trying to give you an example. You ever seen like how interrogation works, <coughs> right? The lengths that people go to to get, you know, a suitable a suitable response to be a means of interrogation. Right, you know, if this don't work, we're gonna level up here. If this don't work, we're gonna level up here. Ultimately, to get whatever the desired result is. You're right. All right. Because uh, if you read, as we read further, right, they embedded their lives with hard work, mortar, with bricks, and with every labor of the field. All their labors that they performed with them were with crushing hardness. So everything mm -hmm. that was inflicted upon the people, right, because of you know the ruling class at that time was intended to fracture the people. Fracture the the growth of the of the nation, if you will. Right? Uh, and if you notice, um, it says uh, in the beginning it says why you may El Amo, right? So he said unto his people, right, uh he nay um the na Yisrael, right? Look, all right, those people, okay, or a people, but um can mean a people. So 
remember how we were talking about this last week, how I was making a distinction with this word um right. and goy and stuff like this, how, it, you know, um in the sense of how we were reading it last week, you know, it makes it very, very interpersonal. Everybody follow what I'm saying? Amen. And that's kind of the, you know, systemic language that you read all throughout the Tanakh uh, when you're talking about Am Yisrael. So, we made that point to kind of discuss and talk about, you know, the idea of grafting in, you know, it may not be how it's been explained over time. You understand what I'm saying? It's very, very interpersonal to the families. Now, this is not to separate things like the gear, you know, those who join unto you, who cleave unto your ways, but specific items that are, regu that are regulated exclusively to the family, all right? This is the, the point that the text is, is conveying to. Everybody understand what I'm saying? So as you, you know, you focus on that vocabulary, you know, these points, you know, they're, they're said over and over and over and over again. Make sense? Okay. Um, uh, this, this is a very, uh, man, I love it, love it. but uh, one aspect of it is that we have to look at it from a picture of sovereignty also. So we're dealing with, we just come out of a portion where Yosef has now made Paro the, the, the richest person in Mitzrayim. Because not only does he own all the land, he owns the people. Because the people was like, you know, we'll be your servant, we'll give you land for food, and we'll be your servant. So now I own the people, and I own the land, except for one area. The only area he doesn't own is Goshen. Goshen belongs to us. Which now makes us, we're in the midst of a nation where now we're a sovereign people in a nation of slaves, in a sense. So you see how that works? In a nation of servants, we're like, we're doing our thing. So they say we wax mighty. Now, mighty in the scriptures talks about like uh, Abraham, he waxed mighty, and he was heavy in gold and silver and kabod, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, obviously we was doing, we had money, we had business, we, you know, that's what Yehuda do, that's what, that's what Israel does. <laughs> we get there, we get our businesses going, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Don't think we wasn't intermingled with Mitch Ryan because how did we build from exactly. 70 souls to right. coming out with 600,000 right. men, registered men alone? You see what I'm saying? Probably had some Mitch Wright wives and things of that nature because we were, we were, we didn't want to be marrying the Canaanite women. You see what I'm saying? So actually, Mitch Ryan was a perfect place for our growth and development. You see what I'm saying? And one aspect of the word, uh, meaning for the word Mitzrayim is chaff. You know, the chaff is what surrounds the wheat, right? Or what protects the wheat. So in essence, Mitzrayim was a perfect place for us to grow and develop. So it wasn't like the most I chose this place because it was like, mm. it's like, no, go there and I'm going to let you grow and develop there. I'm going to let you wax mighty and then I'm going to show myself to you. Then I'm going to reveal myself to you. So... If you look at a king coming in, he's like, man, I got control of everything that did not know Yosef is to say that I ain't got, I ain't got no connections with Yosef. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that was y'all's guy who, I'm in here now. And now he's coming into it from an economical sense, a, a power sense, and he's going, yeah, I got control of all of this except for these guys. I have one area. Think about it. We had a Portsmouth. We owned all the businesses in Portsmouth. We had the money, millions of dollars coming in and out of Portsmouth. It's ours. What's the government going to do? You're going to go, man, I got control of Virginia Beach. I got this. I got Portsmouth, though. They, they do their own thing there. And then now my people come to them to buy merchandise. They get clothes from them. They get holistic foods and medicine from Portsmouth. Now what they going to say? They're going to say, man, this why you're the max. My, them, them, them black people in Portsmouth, they... We got to see. Now, so what does he say? He said, you just can't go in there and take it from what you got to do. He said, let's deal wisely. You turn Kokomo. Let's deal wisely with them. Let's figure out how we can get in there and, in essence, slavery wasn't something that they just came and go, y'all going to build this. Something they did convinced us to, you know, all right, all right, we're going to. You know, and then later on it became burdensome. So, you know, just a thought. Absolutely. Absolutely.
Okay, so so what was the spirit of Israel as we were a separate people? Um, and it, it can't change the hands of time, <laughs> but if they said deal wisely in this situation, uh -huh. so they had to think of a, a, a way to strategize to put us in slavery, what would have happened if they came and they said, no, we're going to strong arm you and make you slaves, mm -hmm. considering the amount of people we are, right. we had. Right. Uh, I guess it, it is a question that is really no answer to. Yeah. Would they have been successful? Exactly. Because if they roll up on us and we outnumber them, right. we're going to eventually look at each other like, look, it's about 50 of them, right. and I see a sea of us behind right. it, right. then tell them to bring it. It, it was just something that, as I was listening to it, it's like they said they had to think wisely, so now they had to manipulate us, mm -hmm. and, and that is something that has not changed. Today, they find ways to manipulate us financially, mm -hmm. spiritually. We're in the midst of a season of spiritual manipulation, so now it's more difficult for those of us that understand truth right. to get the truth to those that are, have their minds still manipulated by the lies and the deceit that okay. the boy he have okay. brought into our midst. Okay. So, if I can, sorry. <laughs> when you think about the word kokma, alright, or uh, kakam, mm -hmm. right, from this root, how does one become wise? Experience. Okay, experience, got you. Counsel. Counsel, got you. Mm -hmm. um, I was. Go ahead, look, look. Observe it. Observe it. Oh, understand it. Understand it. Mm -hmm. Lord, I'm, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> be quiet. <laughs> I would say wisdom only comes from what? Wisdom. Wisdom comes from wisdom. So yeah. the only way to fracture these people is to deal with what? Deal with their mind. What is that called today? Manipulation. Hmm. Uh, Y'all say it all the time. Programming? It's called psychology. psychology. You feel what I'm saying? Alright. So if if you got a if you got a group of people that, you know, you, you gotta consider, you know, some time has went by, right? Some years have, have fled. There's been some observation. Hey look, man, you know, these people, they got some things down to a science, man. Right? Like, what's, what's good? You know, we need to figure out, right? We need to provide some type of instruction to deal with the intellect of these people, right? To mm -hmm. subvert mm -hmm. their production of output. Mm -hmm. That takes years and years and years yeah. right. of studying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Right? And it seems like, you know, what I'll say, you know, it's, it's probably proof that you know that that type of mentality hasn't left, if you will, still lingers. It's still in effect. It's still passed on from generation to generation, and so on and so forth. All right. So it's just something that it's something to think about, you know. Uh, and I saw. Okay, we're gonna move on now. All right, I'm trying. I'm trying to keep it short. Um, you gotta consider. Y'all yeah, put a sheep like mentality on us. Yaakov had that sheep like Mattel, but his sons was true warriors. Uh, his sons wanted to lay with his children on, wouldn't conquer the people because that war like Mattel was in. Mm -hmm. Now, Mizraim is a multitude of people. Somebody rose up with them in the, in the leadership where they, where they forced this leadership on them, where they forced this, this, this thing on them. Yah couldn't move as Yah needed to move. He needed us to fall into this, into this submissive mentality. So you put this sheep like mentality on that makes us flow with the program and not buck against it. Okay. Uh, because if we buck against it, we'd have rose up and we were mighty and then we took, we took them out and they knew this. So they had to come out of a way to keep us humble so that we could move as they would command us to move. So and you gotta you gotta see your hand in that as well. I just, this is a, a quick food for thoughts type situation. As you just said, it took a, a substantial amount of time for them to study how to make these maneuvers so they had to know us as a people. So in this day and time, I, I want us to be wise, those of us that are on social network and like to get on things such as answering all these surveys and these questions. 
uh, you know, who would you be in the Bible or tell me some, some information about yourself and how they try to equip that into the thing. They're doing nothing more than picking your brains to know where we stand as a people because now they have all this data that collectively they can place together and now they know exactly who you are. And if you don't participate, they know who you're in the midst of and how to feed you more lies and what, what is it they can feed you that you will accept so they can continue manipulating you. Food for thought. Shemot chapter 1 starting back at verse 14 and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all kinds of work in the field all their work which they had made them do was with harshness then the sovereign of Mitzrayim spoke to the Hebrew midwives to whom the name of one was Sephirah and to the name of other was Puah and he said, when you deliver the Hebrew women and see them in the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared Elohim and did not do as the sovereign of Mitzrayim commanded them and kept the male children alive. So the sovereign of Mitzrayim called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this? and kept the male children alive. And the midwives said to Paro, because the Hebrew women are not like the Mitzrite women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. So Elohim was good to the midwives, and the people increased and became very numerous. And it came to be, because the midwives feared Elohim, and he provided households for them, oh, that he provided households for them, so got and Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Throw every son who is born into the river, and keep alive every daughter. Remember, the, remember these two names and these two sisters right here. Alright? Sifra, I mean Shifra, alright, and Pua. Alright? Um, and respectively, because this portion is called Shemot, which is the plural for names, alright? You know, Women in Yisrael, right, play a very, 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 very big role, okay? Uh, very, very important, okay? And uh, here you also get a breakdown of some other things, like, right, like midwifery. Um, <clears throat> if you want to call it, uh, what's the word? This is fine to be very cool. I'm just going to stick with midwifery, right? Uh, this is a very common knowledge amongst... Say it again, doulas, like that. Yeah, doulas. All right. You, you got to pay attention to these key components right here, right? Because it's letting you know that we were very, very, uh, very, very intermingled in the necessary sciences to, to take care of business in the nation. All right. And because of that, you know, it's like, where did they get this wisdom from to be able to do these things? Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you kind of think about why there's such a, a market on, uh, you know, disproportionately the mind of, of a woman. Right? Everybody right? follow what I'm saying? women take very, very good care of them. Everybody right? follow what I'm saying? Yeah, okay, okay. okay. Remember that, because we're gonna, that's going to be a third name that we're going to bring up here, too. Go ahead. What were their names again? This is uh, Shifra, Shifra and Pua. Mm -hmm. All right. Shemot chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And a man of the house of Lewi went and married a daughter of Lewi. And the woman conceived and bore a son. And she saw that he was a lovely child. And she hid him three months. And when she could, no, she could not hide him no longer, she took an ark of wicker for him and coated it with tar and pitch and put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the edge of the river. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. And the daughter of Paro came down to wash herself at the river and her young women were walking by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her female servant to get it and opened it 
and saw the child, and see, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the children of the Hebrews. And his sister said to Paro's daughter, Shall I go call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Paro's daughter said to her, Go. And the girl went and called the child's mother. And Paro's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me. Who, who, who did they call? Who was the mother? Who was the mother? <laughs> what is her name? Her, right, what's her name? Anybody know? Was it Shepherd? Yeah, it was wasn't Shepherd. Is his name Yakabel? Oh. Uh -oh. Look at, look at, look at, look at who my guy right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Your head. Your head. Very Beautiful name. Remember that name too. All right, close it. All right, take this child, uh, Sligar, Shemot chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, and Paro's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me. Then I shall pay your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him to Paro's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moshe, saying, Because I have drawn you from the water. And in those days it came to be, when Moshe was grown, that he went out to his brothers and looked at their burdens. And he saw a Mitzrite beating a Hebrew, one of his brothers. So he turned this way and that way, and when he saw no one, he smote the Mitzrite and hid him in the sand. And he went out the second day and saw two Hebrew men fighting. And he said to them, he said to the one, excuse me, God, who did the wrong, why do you smite your neighbor? And he said, who made you a head and a judge over us? Do you intend to slay me as you slew the Mitzrayim? And Moshe feared and said, truly this matter is known. And Pyro heard of this matter, and he sought to kill Moshe. But Moshe fled from the face of Pyro, and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. And the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came and drew water. And they filled their troughs to water their father's flocks. But the shepherds came and drove them away. And Moshe stood up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. And they came to Re Reuel's, their father, and, and he said, how is it that you have come so soon today? And they said, A Mitzrite rescued us from the hand of the shepherds, and he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, And where is he? Why did you leave the man? Call him and let him eat bread. Okay, a couple questions, right? <clears throat> Midian. What's significant about Midian? Mm -hmm. Those are our cousins. About folks? Yeah. Our cousins? Okay. What else? Why not? Do they also worship the Most High? That's a very good question. Do they also worship the Most High? So that's going to segue into another question. We'll kind of answer that. Uh, Reuel, what does that mean? Well, L means well, the high power. Okay, so L means power. Okay. Reuel. Reuel. All right, so it's two words in there, right? Mm -hmm. One being Reya, mm -hmm. the other being L. Okay, uh, literally a friend of L. So you mean to tell me, the Most High, you know, this event takes, you know, takes place. And uh, Moshe, for all intents and purposes, is led to drop to go out to Midian, and he runs smack dab into a friend of him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is uh is Midian is, is Midian Israel? No. No. 
So you mean to say there's nobody for Moshe to deal with, you know, that's in the family? I'll say close and personal family. Let me say that. Why why Reuel? She's a priest. Okay, he's a priest, he's a Kohen. He knows a little bit about the Most High, maybe not as much as Joseph, but he, just, he is familiar with the Most High. Not as much as Joseph. Mm-hmm. You, well, gotta, you gotta remember the outcome of this uh this situation here. Right. You know, when Moshe leaves. Right, he, 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 he sees um, counsel from him. Counsel from him. Right. He gets Moshe, that's why I say, maybe not as much as Joseph, but he knows about the Most High. So what does this teach you about how and when I, when I ask this question, you know, just, just bear with me. What does this teach us about the, the plural majesty of the Creator? Mm. In terms of dealing with other nations and other people outside of Israel. Mm. Got to show them the first two that Abraham Okay. All right. I have a question. Uh, okay. Reuel, there is nothing that says outside of his name from the Most High that says he knew the Most High. Is it because Reuel is willing to accept the proper teaching of what he learns about him in the process? Being a priest, now we don't know. We don't know he was a priest. He said he was a priest, but a priest of what? He was a priest of Midian. A priest. Who did they? Who did they worship in, in Midian? We don't. We don't. Did he know? Did he know anything of Abraham? Did he know anything of Ishtar? So, does everybody remember when we talked about this word right here, uh, El, and how that was culturally relevant? You know, what I'm saying in the in the landmass of that dispensation of time. So the concept of El, right? It wasn't a it wasn't a foreign concept. It wasn't a it wasn't something that was, uh, you know, indistinguishable from the notion of the one, the all, the supreme intellect, the power of all powers, right? When you say uh, Reuel is willing to accept, accept Moshe, is that what you said? Accept, accept Moshe. Well, when, we, when he went down and he, he went and he spent time with Moshe, uh, he in, in heard of what was going on. He was willing to accept Moshe's power as his power. Now, El, all of them, everybody had the El for sake. Everybody had their power for sake. Uh, uh, Midian, there's nothing that says Midian, that, that Moshe, that Yaakov El was Midian El at the time. And he might have, and he, and he may have been. I, I can't answer that, and I can't say it's not all he is. But there's nothing that addressed that. So, so the question is, the question is, that you ask, why, why was he uh, uh, accepted? Is it because he was willing, because of his heart was willing to accept, and Yah might have known that he was willing to accept him as a power, or uh, uh, as the one true living El, once he got with Moshe and started learning more? Well, there's nothing that kind of suggests what you're saying. That's, well, uh, there's nothing that suggests any otherwise either. Well, well uh, the, the point that I'm making is, is that you have a situation that is completely different from his experience up until this point. You have a man, right? He just killed a man, right? Moshe, yes. Moshe just killed a man, okay? And he flees to another place. Like my ox said, he goes amongst relatives, okay? So amongst relatives, right? What's, what's the common knowledge amongst relatives? The concept of what? Okay, yeah, family. Yeah, we, we can say that. All right, let me, maybe this is y'all remember. When they said that Abraham was going to be gathered to his people when he was buried, right? Mm-hmm. Who were those people? This is family. Okay, so. His descendants. Did they know of the El that Abraham knew of? Yes. Okay, so y'all follow what I'm saying? I got you. So being as family, they all were familiarized with El. You understand? Yeah. So, you know, and this is why we kind of got it. I would encourage everybody to study the concept of idolatry and what it entails. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Because if you look at the relationship that these two people build together, right? At this point, Moshe has been brought up according to the ways of 
Miss Ryan, for all we know, he's brought up in that genre of public policy. Right. Right? Whatever's going on in that known region, that's what he came up with. When Yosef got there, Yosef was 17 years old, right? So he, you know, he learned some things from his album. We can we can conclude from what the text says. But what's going on in his mind that ultimately, what is he learning? You know, there's a lot of things that the Torah doesn't really talk about, you know, right. as far as what's written. So the point that I'm making is, you know, this is a very, very unique situation. I would call it the University of Ray Newman. That's what I would call it. Mm. Me personally. Okay? Because here he's getting into the the, uh, the, uh, the the very, very important details for learning how to judge matters, deal with people, okay. social enactments. You know what I'm saying? The whole, the whole, he's, I mean, that, that, you know, it doesn't explicitly say that. But from the outcome that we read about, you know that he learned something. Mm -hmm. For a man to be there for 40 years, right? There's a lot of, I say a lot of understanding is taking place in that experience. And if all, you know, well, I'll say that for later. Uh, um, um, that, to my understanding, if we look at Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yepha, we, we know that. And they all had the same understanding of El, or, you know, of God the same way um, Noah did, because Noah was, you know, it says, it never says, Yah always says God or, El, or Elohim was the one who told Noah to build an ark. So, even when they were all alive, when they built the tower, they still all spoke one language. They didn't speak different languages until after they came together. So, just because they were speaking different languages doesn't mean the concept of Elohim was different, just that how they spoke it was different. So when we look at um, a maniac man, who we all know he's a, a offspring of Ham or Shem or anything of that nature, but we do understand that El being a universal understanding of Elohim or the, the Great One, the Creator, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be far off to understand that there are people who still kept the right rulings and the righteousness of those teachings. It's just that they were just displaced in different areas and as they grow as families and their own ways and their knowledge, they just pass that understanding and their knowledge on. You want to say something for them? Yeah, I'm going to always do that. <laughs> Anybody know what's the root of meeting you? Say it again, yeah. huh? Ding. Ding. Oh, the root of Midian is Ding. Ding means to judge. Yeah. Mm. Everybody understand that? From judging. Mm. Ding. All right, so you might hear Muslims say stuff like, I'm on my Ding. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm. So we're talking about, and if you understand, you know, as you study languages and stuff like that, these terms are synonymous. Okay? So it's befitting, all right, from what we're getting from the text, that Moshe would go to a place. Mm -hmm. He would link up with the individual that's going to teach him the orchestration of learning how to judge. Mm -hmm. So when the Most High says he requires that you judge what? Righteousness. What are you going to learn in that? Mm -hmm. Through experiment. Right. 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 So let me, let me, hold on, okay. Let me, let me, let me bring it home, right? Uh, let's see, it's okay. okay. If we gave you a gallon and a black robe and you sat on the bench and you had to judge matters, mm -hmm. could you do that right now? Depends on what the matter is. Okay, you say it depends on what the matter is. Because I may not be experienced in a certain matter that needs to be judged and I may not be experienced in that situation. You're not going to say no. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say no. So you're not qualified. Right, okay. Okay, so when you're judging things, what comes into place? You gotta learn, you gotta understand social enactments. Wow. You gotta understand yeah. the, call, the nature of causation with people, mm -hmm. yes. right? To judge righteously, it's, it's, it's important to understand or take a, 
uh, take a look at why a person might do the things that they do. Mm. Right. You understand what I'm saying? It's just, you know, there's there's so many different things that come into rendering righteous judgment. Does that, does that make sense to what I'm saying? Okay. So this experience that Moshe is getting ready to encounter, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of context clues that kind of bring this point together. Everybody follow me so far? Okay. 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 Uh, Moshe was raised in the ways of Miss Ryan. He was raised in Pharaoh's household. He was taught with with the very people that says, let us judge cruelly with these people. So he was taught right and wrong judgment. He, before he left out of misrate, that teaching was given to him before. He, so when he wondered how many years, how long, however long he took, he picked up some stuff along the way. And then when he got there, this that's why he could see the people was mistreating the daughter, and he judged between that because he knew it was wrong for them to do what he was doing, and he fought for them. So that, that judgment that he had was given to him or taught him in this reign. Okay, so I'm a, uh, okay. Go ahead, my brother, in the back. <laughs> I, I apologize for that's wrong. Um, at what age do we get understanding, like, uh, right and wrong, good and evil, good and evil, bad and good? At what age is that coming to us? So I think that that is individually curtailed to each individual. But it's got to be a, a bracket, a time frame that we're thinking about. Well, one could say that by the age of 12, you should know that this is right and this is wrong. But the evidence is, is that when you look at the nature of causation with people, that's probably not relevant for every individual. Because some people clearly don't understand that it is wrong to steal out of the store. <laughs> <laughs> that's real. That's real. Yeah, they don't understand that it's wrong to take things that don't belong to you. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that it's wrong, right, to murder. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that it's wrong, right, to deal with somebody else's wife. They understand that it's wrong. All right? Y'all yeah, follow what I'm saying? Okay. So we could say, yes, by this age, it should be signed, sealed, delivered. You should know this is right and this is wrong. As a matter of fact, Yisrael should have learned a long time ago <laughs> what's right and what's wrong. That's true. There are a lot of adults in Yisrael that don't know right from wrong, clearly. Okay. And I, w I would even pose a question, uh, not to cut you off, uh, Mure, uh, I would even pose a question is that, one is that do people know it's not wrong to steal? Because to, to, to steal means to do something in stealth, mm -hmm. right? When a child doesn't know something is wrong, they do it right in front of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't care whether you're looking, they don't care, because they don't know that it's not wrong. But when you correct them right, the next time, guess how they do it? They look at you first. <laughs> There you go. That's true. So there's something innate in you that starts to develop in you as you mature. Time, age is very important. It's prophetic, period, right? So there's a couple different things that this particular portion brings out. It says that Moshe was grown, mm -hmm. right? It uses the term that said he was grown. grown. It says when he was grown. Mm -hmm. Now, so we may not look at that as important. Uh, Moriad said it, uh, I'll get to that in a second, but he said he was grown. And he went out and looked at the affliction of his people. Now, by oral tradition, we know that we understand that Moshe was 40 years old. Right? So if it says he was 40 and he was grown, that would imply something to me that as a man or a woman hits 40, when you hit 40, you're grown. At this point, you should have a certain level of intellect where you can judge righteously, you can see matters before they happen, you should be at a certain level of understanding and clarity at the age of 40, right? Because in your 30s is when you really wake up. Man hit 30 and they like, you know what, you, you 30, the excuses start going away when you hit your 30s. You start like, nah, you shouldn't be 30 something years old acting like this. 20s, you give people a pass in 20s. You say, it's still a child, you know, 25 year old. To me now where I'm at, I'm 37. 
When somebody is a 20 year old, when I hear them talking, it sounds like a bunch of, to me, it's like they don't know nothing about life yet. You know what I'm saying? But they look like adults, they, they feel like it, so they talk like how they understand life. But then when I got 30, I started to realize like, man, they don't have a lot of wisdom. Not to say that's applicable for every 20 something year old, but for the majority, that's just the way it plays out. Most of our forefathers, when you read Bereshit chapter 11, they were getting married at the age of 36 and 37. Oh, Pay attention right. to the general right. age where they right. were getting married. Right. Why? Because now you start to mature, you start to have yourself stable, a certain <laughs> level of stability. When you have a certain level of stability, you can judge better. That's why a man who's not stable, his judgment is off. It says, oppression takes a wise man's reason. That's what the prophet said, or the, the wise man said. Certain things make mess up your reasoning. So he said he was grown. And then he went out there, looked on the affliction of the people. He killed the misright. Then it said that he went to his brothers. He judged who was wrong in the matter. He said, why are you your neighbor? You know what I'm saying? Just to let you know what your neighbor is, right? He said, why are you doing this to your neighbor? And then the man said something to him. He said, who made you a judge and a what over us? A head or a person. Right. Who made you a, a head and a judge over us? So that would be applicable to you being wise and you saying something. They're like, nigga, who are you? <laughs> That's the basically terminology that they used to him at that time. Nigga, who are you? <laughs> who made, nigga, who made you the governor? Definitely. Who made you the king? That's how they were talking the most shape. In essence, the creator had already made him that. Okay. He right. was already that before he knew he was that. Yeah. That's why he just innately did what he did. It was already in him. And then he goes to uh, Midian, the place of judgment, and then becomes a shepherd for 40 years. Mm, right. So now that he is mature, grown, now the Most High starts to use him for his purpose. Mm. You understand? See how that works? When a man mature, a man or a woman matures, then the Most High starts to really, wisdom starts to walk with that person mm. and say, okay, now I'm going to order you, now I'm going to start. Before that, you know, I'm not saying it don't happen, but... Most of the people in this not, they were at a mature age, which is why it was so shocking when a young prophet, prophet that wasn't necessarily 17 years old, he might have been 25, 26, saying, man, I'm but a youth. I can't go prophesy to these elders over here. They in their 50s and 40s and 60s. I can't go prophesy to them. Most I said, go do it anyway. So let's just let you know the culture is not like our culture where you got 25-year-olds running around here like they can tell you about marriage and stuff. Anybody has been married for 30 years ago, okay. They'll be like, yeah. You understand? So just some thoughts behind the, the little details, the little nuggets that the Tanakh has given us to let you know, like, he was grown. Who made you a judge and a head over us? Mm -hmm. Went to Midian. Come to, sh you know. So, <clears throat> oh, wait, I'm sorry. I looked up Midian. Mm -hmm. And I got son of Abraham and also got brawling and contention. Right. So how how exactly was he connected to Abraham? Who Minion? Mm -hmm. Minion is uh his grandson. His grandson. His grandson. Abraham's grandson. Is, uh no Minion is from uh Couture. Yeah from Couture. Couture. Yeah. From Couture. Yeah that's his grandson. Okay and and brawling and contention. So, right, Midian means strife, okay? The root of Midian is demon. So, here's a little, here, here, here's the thing, right? Mm. A lot of words in Hebrew, they're borrowed words. Everybody follow what I'm saying? So, it may have an unused root that you don't necessarily find in, you know, the Hebrew lingua franca, okay? So, Dean, Okay, this is dealing with a, a uh, Aramaic word, meaning to judge. You follow what I'm saying, anyone? Mm -hmm. So that's that's how we get the, if you want to call it the mixture or the binding together, whatever the case may be, that's how we get it. Mm -hmm. Which it makes sense. So if you read this, if you go back into verse 11 in chapter 2, it, it said, It happened in those days when we became grown, right? They used the word gadol. Mm -hmm. Gadol, or gadol. You know, gadol does mean to make great. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
in its root form, but dog means to twist together. Mm -hmm. So when you, t when you twist a bunch like this, right? Take a bunch okay. of rope okay. and intertwine mm -hmm. it together. Okay. What does it become? Strong. Strong. It's durable. It's durable. built for the car. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. It's meant to withstand what? Great. Static Great. load, mm -hmm. which is testing. And morality. Everybody follow what I'm saying? So it's befitting that he's at, a, he's at a stage in his life where he can put things together. That, does that make sense? So he's coming up in the ways of Mitch Ryan. He's getting ready to go and deal with Ray Uel for a period of 40 years. And then come out on the other side, right? And you'll see that, you know, by the time he gets to Torah, if you study, study other uh, legal codes up into this dispensation of time, you'll see that the Torah you know, has a, you know, adopted a lot of things that were aforementioned. Code of Hammurabi, Sumerian legal code, you know what I'm saying? A lot of these things are, yeah, I mean, all that stuff, you'll find it. Because the concept of, once again, L and how people interacted with each other, right? It wasn't this mystical thing. You know what I'm saying? We like to make it that way, but you know, I, this is me saying this. I don't hold that I can put the creator in the box. Okay. I won't put him in the box. You know what I'm saying? Because I see that he's dealing with other people all throughout the scriptures. Okay. You know, uh, Abimelech that Abraham dealt with wasn't a Hebrew as far as we know. He didn't come from the loins of, of Shem, as far as we know. Yet he was able to recognize El and Abraham. He was able to succumb to a righteous way of thinking. Now look, I can't deal with that man's wife. You got me killed. Mm -hmm. This is what he said, right? Okay. I mean, so contextually, you know, that kind of, you know, I would say that's I wouldn't say that, me personally. I would not put the most high in the box. I would not. He's, he's, he's greater than that. Okay. Um, and then, so, if you get a chance, look at the origin of the word juvenile. Say that Moshe was 40 years old, right? All right. Free English, right? When you get into, like, Latin and stuff like that, juvenile, you're juvenile from the, from the age of 18 or 21 all the way up to 40. That's how it was considered in Rome. Okay? And so... If you, if you kind of think about that concept of what it means to be a juvenile, a juvenile is somebody that can't really put things together right now. You still learn. Mm -hmm. Everybody follow what I'm saying? Okay. Markers. Just a thought. All right. Everybody good? Okay. Okay. Totally. Let's just continue. All right. Uh, Shemot, chapter 2, verse 21. And Moshe agreed to dwell with the man, and he gave Zipporah, his daughter, to Moshe. Mm -hmm. And she bore him a son, and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have become a sojourner in a foreign land. So, and it came to be. So there's, that, a, there's that word Gary. There's that word Gary. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. The root of his name is Gary. And he named his son based on what? The experience that he was having. Right? So, if you notice, he's saying that I've become a foreigner in a strange land. I'm not amongst my people. My family, my kindred, my cousins, my kinfolk. Third, fourth, second, third, fourth generation of people that I know, I'm somewhere else. <laughs> Shemot chapter 2 verse 22 Aleya. Aleya. and she bore him a son and he called his name Gershon for he said I have become a sojourner in a foreign land and it came to be after these many days that the sovereign of Israel died and the children of Israel groaned because of the slavery and they cried out and their cry came up to Elohim because of the slavery. And Elohim heard their groaning, and Elohim remembered his covenant with Abraham, Yitzchak, 
and Yaakov. And Elohim looked on the children of Israel, and Elohim knew. I want to reemphasize the blessing that we learned about last week and the pronunciation of the blessing over these children that we talked about last week. You know, may that offspring, may we be like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you notice that when the children of Israel cried out, used the, the word there, Sa'ak, which is a piercing cry, it's no different than, you know, that cry that, like, when your baby is screaming and you know something is going on, that's the magnitude of what's being described right here. All right, the outcry of the people was that great that it got the attention of the Creator. And then it says, He remembered His company with who? The same people that received the blessing. Okay. So if you understand the magnitude of the blessing and how we apply this blessing over our children from generation to generation, there are a lot of things that are, that are attached to that. Directly, you know, you know a, a, a sufficient line of communication with the Creator. Who spoke it? Who gave it? Guess what? That's very, very interpersonal. That's in the family. Everybody follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so that kind of, to me, I heard a law of attraction too. Okay. So I heard a lesson basically, if you're not crying out to the most high in the time of need, and that means that you don't necessarily want to be saved. So if we're in, in the land of our captivity, and we're not trying to be saved, we're, we're just, you know, comfortable or what have you, then there's no need for the most high to want to necessarily come and save us because we're not going to be saved. So it was a thing too, like, um, what do you call it, whatever you give your energy to, Cause, like you're, you're boosting that up when you talk to it or talk about it. When you talk about someone, you're giving your energy to them, making them more, you know, so you know what I'm saying? Something to happen. So something will manifest for us. Okay. All right. Shemot chapter 3, verse 1. Hallelujah. 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 And Moshe was shepherding the flock of Yitro, his father in law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the wilderness. Wait, what about Rehu? <laughs> What's going on here? Just letting you know he's the priest of Midian. Let you know, let us know he's the priest of Midian. Title. Title. Anybody know what you throw me? <clears throat> Yitro means abundance. From the root yatar, right? which means access or remainder. So think about this. He goes to a place where there's, where there's an abundance. An abundance of what? Knowledge, wisdom, stuff. You know, you know, trying to get everybody to, to think outside the, you know, the, the, the literal concept of what you said. Yes, he absolutely did go amongst Reuel, Yithro, Midian, cousins. But think about the spiritual and personal development that's taking place with the individual. Mm. Which is unanimous with the same development that has to take place with who? The people, right? As far as where they're at. They got to grow, they got to develop in the same, you know, you got to... Uh, uh, a double transaction taking place. But somebody has to be called to a, a greater estate. Okay? We started with the name Ruel. Mm -hmm. Then we went to the name Yitro. Mm -hmm. Now Yitro could be a title. Ruel could be a title. Whichever his name was, or whichever the people called him, could be two different things. Because it's not known, it's, it's common for us to have, or people to have more than one name based on what's going on. And you might have given that name because when we think of abundance, we think of abundance in America's terms. <clears throat> we think about lots of money and, 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 and lots of cars and how we got stuff to give away. Well, he may have been that person as well. There's nothing that says he wasn't. Or, or abundance may be, may be in other ways, in, in children and in uh, 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 cattle and, and stuff of that nature. The so, most didn't acquire a lot of children. No, I'm not talking about most. Okay. I'm talking about Negro. I'm talking about I'm talking about Ruel, his father-in-law. 
See, he went, he went from Ruel to Yitro, and we wonder why did his name change to Ruel to Yitro. So culturally, a lot of people had more than one name. Right. So, <clears throat> like this, right? I'm, 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 I'll bring it together. Remember, it said that Moshe was grown, right? Mm -hmm. What I say Gadol means? To, to twist things together, right? Yatar, right, which is the root of Yitro, it means cord. Mm -hmm. Or rope. What? Cord. Cord. Rope. Cord. cord. You know, like an excess. So, like if you, so for an example, you, you ever tie something off with a piece of rope before? You know, the excess rope that you have, you know, you can use it for something else. Everybody, everybody mm -hmm. understand what yeah, I'm saying? Cool. That's what his name, that's, no, let me ask <clears throat> I'm trying to, trying to paint a picture of what's going on. Er, er, is everybody following me so far? Mm -hmm. I got the title of Yitro for the, the, the as excellence. You got excellence? Yeah, and Strong's. Yeah, we'll have to talk about Strong's maybe at a later time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, I, I got you. <clears throat> we'll talk about Strong's later. All right. Yes, sir. Right. Shemot, chapter 3, verse 1. And Moshe was shepherding the flock of Yitro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of Elohim. And the Malach of Yah appeared to him in the flame of a fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked and saw the bush burning with fire but the bush was not consumed. And Moshe said, let me turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And the Most High said, the Most High saw, sweet God, that he turned aside to see, and Elohim called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe. And he said, Hunane, here I am. And he said, do not come near here. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place which you are standing is set apart ground. And he said, I am the Elohim of your Abba, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yitzhak, and the Elohim of Yaakov. And Moshe hid his face, for he was afraid to look at Elohim. And the Most High said, I have indeed seen the oppression of my people who are in Mitzrayim. And have heard their cry because of their slave drivers, for I know their sorrows. And I have come down to deliver them from the hand of the Mitzrites, and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaani, and the Hitti, and the Emory, and the Perazi and the Hewi, or Hewi, and the Yebusi. And now see, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with, with which the Mitzrites oppressed them. And now come, I am sending you to Paro to bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Mitzrayim. And Moshe said to Elohim, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And that I should bring the children of Israel out of Mitzrayim. And he said, because I am with you, and this is to you the sign uh, that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Mitzrayim, you are to serve Elohim on this mountain. And Moshe said to Elohim, see when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the Elohim of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And Elohim said to Moshe, If ye asher at ye, I am that I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, If ye has sent you. And Moshe said further, No, sleep out. And Elohim said further to Moshe, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, Yahweh Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yitzchak, the Elohim of Yaakov has sent me to you. This is my name forever, 
and this is my remembrance to all generations. Go, and you shall gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Most High Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, Yisak, and Yaakov, appeared to me, saying, I have indeed visited you and seen what is done to you in Mitzrayim. And I say, I am bringing you out of, out of the affliction of, the, of Mitzrayim to the land of the Cana, Canaanite, or Canaanite, and the Kitty, and the Amori, and the Perizzi, and the Hewi, and the Yebusi, to the land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall listen to your voice, and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the sovereign of Mitzrayim, and you shall say to him, Yahweh Elohim of the Hebrews has met with us. And now, please let us go three days journey into the wilderness to slaughter to Yahweh Elohim. But I know that the sovereign of Mitzrayim is not going to let you go, not even by a strong hand. And I shall give this people favor in the eyes of the Mitzrites, and it shall be that when you go, you shall not go out empty-handed. But every woman shall ask from her neighbor and from the stranger in her house objects of silver and objects of gold and garments, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters and shall plunder the Mitzrites. By the way, why are the women, why shall the women request from their neighbor, from the one who lives in her house, the vessels of silver, gold, garments, so on and so forth. Remember I talked about Nashim earlier, right? Um, women that get wise and understanding how you need to get things. So <laughs> it's a way of going. So they got the necessary <laughs> skill sets to acquire. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We know what we need to haul away with us, and we know what they have. We have been in more contact with other women, so we know that they have what we need. Um, to kind of um, go more with what you were saying, the women normally know what the house needs in order for travel. Like if, even nowadays, if you really think about it, if we go on a road trip, I may forget something. A lot of pain. Just, I may forget something. But Maisha, like, you got the bug spray, you got this, you got that. You know, they they know what, if we're normally out and, out and about doing what we have to do, they're normally the ones inside the home, knowing what we need inside the home to travel. They were made for that. They, they were built for that. <laughs> right, right, right. But well, I'm going to say, if you look at Maisha at first, right now, you got something there. <laughs> You may need in there. <laughs> <laughs> I think y'all all skipping around the burning bush. <laughs> I think it would be like, are those leather sandals right there? <laughs> Let me get those. Uh, <laughs> them silk shirts y'all got? Let me get a couple of those. Gold earrings? Yeah, let me get all of those, you know. I mean, you can go in there and get it, you know. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. The women were working in these houses. They were working for these Egyptian women. They knew exactly what they had and they knew exactly what they wanted, period. It was easy to get to. I know what you have. I've already done in this with this one. Okay, so real quick, right? The burning bush. Somebody explain to me what happened right there. What happened right here at the burning bush? But no, um, like it says, it was, um, did they use the word for fire in the Hebrew? Because I, I didn't really see it as a fire, more like, like an aura of the Mosai, kind of like consumed the bush, so it was perceived as a fire, is the way I looked at it. It was looked at like, oh, this is burning, but it's not burning. It does use the word. To use the word what? A ship fire. 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 Right, right. If I see anything burning, it's not being consumed. 
from a distance, it'll, it'll draw me closer to take a closer look at it. Okay. So when he says, when he, when he turned to look, when he got his attention, he didn't say, you call it to him. That, that's your attention now. Maybe he just like a lot in regards to like his maturity level, you know, because he went, he got with Jethro, you know, advanced his land mightily, you know, and he was a judge. So maybe at this time he had enough, you know, understanding of judgment for the most high to say, okay, this cry is happening, he's mature, it's time to introduce myself so we can get, you know, what needs to occur happening. Okay. Anybody else? Does anybody, does anybody remember when we talked about um, standing in the council of Elohim? You remember when we talked about that? And how that's, you know, that's relegated to uh, Nebuchadnezzar and, you know, seers and things of that kind of sort, right? So, when, like, for example, when the, when the prophet uh, Yerli Yahu was asking the question, you know, who has stood in the council of Elohim, mm -hmm. right? Another thing that's kind of taking place, right, is, you know, uh, one thing that I got from it was Moshe's commissioning into prophethood, if you will, right? You know, these things, it's, it's gradually taking place. Like you said, you see in the bush that's, uh, that's not being consumed. Uh, there's some things that's going on in his mind, right? And there's some conceptual, conceptualization of the Most High, of the Creator, the all that's taking place within the intellect of Moshe. And he says, uh, you know, as far as what we read, you know, you're going to go back and you're going to say these things, right? Specifically, get the elders, uh, let them know the things that I said to you. You're going to go to Pharaoh. You're going to, you know, request a three days journey, but check it out. I know that he's not going to let it happen, right? And ultimately, this is going to serve as a greater, uh, a, uh, a greater deed as we read throughout the, the context of the story. But... What I want to emphasize is, you know, the the uh, the the importance of of uh, the phrase. That I, I'm using this phrase, uh, the standing in the council of the Elohim, and you know, kind of the picture that that entails, right? Uh, so <clears throat> when we go about and you know, kind of see like people throwing prophets and stuff like that around, kind of loosely and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I would say that there are some consistent things that we read about from our ancestors that kind of give way to, you know, how things like that really transpire. Does everybody make sense what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, you know. All right, Shemot, chapter 4, verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Moshe answered and said, And if they do not believe me, nor listen to my voice, and say, Yahweh has not appeared to you. And Yahweh had said, uh, and Yahweh said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moshe fled from it. And the Most High said to Moshe, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. So that they believed that the Most High Elohim of their fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yitzhak, and the Elohim of Yaakov has appeared to you. And the Most High said to him, again, now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, and see his hand was leprous, like snow. And he said, Put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. And see, it was restored like his other flesh. And it shall be, if they do not believe you, nor listen to the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take uh, water from the river and pour it on dry land. And the, and the water which you take from the river shall become blood on dry land. And Moshe said to the Most High, O Yahweh, I am not a man of words, 
neither before nor since uh, you have spoken to your servant. For I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. What does he what does he say? What does that mean when he's talking about? He stutters. And he stutters? He has some form of speech impediment. Some form of speech impediment? Where'd you get that from? I'm just asking. Is he slow of speech or slow of tongue? Okay. <laughs> slow of speech. Maybe how he communicates with them may not be understandable because he was raised in the Proverbs house. So he's talking, they probably still speak in their language and he knows it, but he doesn't know it well enough to communicate what it is that um, he's being commissioned to say. I think he's just, I, I think that if he had a speech impediment, he was he grew up in Pharaoh's house, they probably got him all the help he needed. I believe that, that not that it's not possible. Um, I believe that he didn't know if he could deliver the message and he was hesitant. And some people they think a long time before they address you. Right. Um so they are slow of speech. Right. Very it doesn't mean there's a speech impediment or anything like that. Right. They're just not quick to jump in there. Right. It's a completely different situation for him, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Um, she hit the nail on the head because I, I live with it. Um, I talk to my Isha sometimes and I'm like, are you buffering? I asked her and she takes a while to think about what she's gonna say. So so when you say slow of speech, you more you more cautious on what you're gonna say and try to find the right words, and it takes a while, and people get impatient with that sometimes, but I speak to you, you speak back to me. If it takes a while, you know, I'm talking to myself, you know, so, 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 so that's basically what I get when he says I'm slow of speech. I don't have to take back anything I say, because I thought about it. Um, and I would say, um, it's, it's, uh, I would say this myself. Um, it's hard to stand in front of Israel at times because there's a certain uh, expectation that you should bring and what they're looking for. And sometimes you, they'll shoot you down. Israel will shoot you down quick, you know, in a certain way. And I think it goes back to when he was dealing with his uh, the fellows, with, with his brethren, when they were smiting each other and they came off at him that that way, you know, then, and he's like, he's thinking, he probably thinking about that self whole situation too, mm -hmm. so. Because I talked about last week when somebody ran up and told you that you're gonna do whatever you did, mm -hmm. like, in the past, what you should do, it's like that type of situation, like you said. So, could be that. Uh, one aspect of what Moshe is saying is based on just his, his character type. Mm -hmm. Personalities are everything, character is everything. Uh, most high picks a man based on what he built him for. So in order for Moshe to do the task that he was given, it says that he was the most meek or humble man on of all men, right? So a lot of times people who are very humble, they're not quick to speak. So you might even ask them something, they may sit there and be like, because they're not used to, you see what I'm saying? That's a humble mentality. Now, mine is not so much like that. You know, I, I'm quick. You know, some people are real quick. If you notice, like, I'm picking on New Yorkers for a minute. Please don't. Please don't. Please don't. Please don't. Please don't. They quick. New Yorkers are quick, man. They, they quick. They quick at the time. They, they, they train like that. It's an environment of quick talkers. You know what I'm saying? From when I was up there, I'll say that. When I lived up there, it was like, man, they was like, you dumb country, because it took me so long to kind of like, to, you know, figure it out. And eventually you start getting with the, but when you have a, a humble mentality, you're not as quick to, it takes time to bring it out or what you're thinking to put it into words or whatnot. So a lot of, a lot of that, what he said, it was that came and also along with his character type. Most of the most humble man on the planet. You see what I'm saying? So he figured things out, he paid attention, and then when he put it to words, you know what I'm saying? But when you're in the presence of a king, mm -hmm. a king don't want to be sitting there like, right. <laughs> like, I'm asking you a question here, you know, like, come on. Mm -hmm. 
when you're in the presence of a king, you know, it's like, like you're doing a presentation for a CEO of a big company, you're trying to get, you know what I'm saying? You gotta, you don't wanna be sitting up there like, hold on, let me, let me, what? They get annoyed very fast with that, you see what I'm saying? So he's like, man, Aharon, he's built for this, you know what I'm saying? Aharon's built for talking because he's the head of the household. He's actually your, your older brother who's the head of the household, who's really the one who's chosen to do these things. If you notice that your oldest, they usually can speak for the family real quick. You know, they usually on it, because that's just what they do. You see what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, it's like, get your older brother, let him, be, let him be your mouth, and you just relate to him what I say. You know, so. I also like to just uh, add to it that, you know, when you think of somebody being mild and you, mm. um, you think of them as soft mm. sense mm. a lot of times. So if you before somebody, you always want to present the strongest possible front to to the figurehead. So by this brother being the person or the character mm. that he was, Fine. that you put the strength to his side so that way he can speak with the authority right. and right. deliver the message of court. Fine. Mm. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next question. Why those three signs? Mm. The rod, leprosy, and water in uh, Mayan and Dom. All right. Why those three signs to be a witness? What's like? What's what's going on with that? You know. It says ask them the question. Right. It says uh, what is in your hand? Right. Mm -hmm. Why were these three signs utilized to convey the message? Or what message should you get from this? Mm. Well, I would see the rod like direction, you know, because that's what he led people with, you know, and you know, also like instruction. Okay, so let's uh, let's go back. The rod turned into what? Okay. Serpent, right? And a kosh. Anybody know the Hebrew word for rod? Okay. Mate, right? That's one of them. That is one of them. Uh, that one, that's not what's used here, though. Uh, mate was used here. Um, and uh, specifically, uh, the difference is, is maquel, it doesn't mean tribe or branch, whereas mate does. Okay, so my quill, that deals more so with the rod that Yaakov had. They use that, they use that word with that, you know, with that particular rod that he had, that he utilized for it. My take is what's used here with, with Moshe. So if, and, and keep, keep this in mind, right? You know, the rod must always be kept intact, right? If it's not kept intact, Kind of get loose, okay. you know. Probably get into the wrong wisdom, the wrong experience, right? Because the kosh means what? The kosh means like whisperer, right, or one that is experienced. That's what the kosh means. So, the rod or the the tribe or the branch left untamed or unchecked can get out of control. You gotta keep it, you gotta keep a firm grasp on it. Okay? Now why the hand? Why turning the hand to leprosy? What's what's good with that? <coughs> Come on, y'all talk about of, this one. I guess to have his hand turn leprous to show the power of the most high. Like at the at the instant that it's not the whispering, so can it make something like that change? Okay, I mean, I'll roll with that. So think about it. He sticks his hand in his bosom, right? What's, what, where's the closest place the hand is at? So what are we dealing with? There's a word that's used there, it's called kayak, mm. all right? Kayak deals specifically with the, the inner being, the emotions, the mind, right? So what kind of shapes how you do things? Your heart, right? 
Okay? So when you out of control like that, you know, what, what can happen? Your works, what can happen? Say it again. Just go away. I mean, I mean, there's a turning of that individual's mind. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So think about how these, you know, an individual or a mind left unkept, untaught, untrained, right, can turn. Mm -hmm. Can it? Can it not? Can. Okay. Hence the reason why we must what? Return. Return. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. These actions, right, they have a, a very, very high significance on life. Remember we talked about life last week? Okay. What is life? It's not. Hmm? It's not. Okay, yeah, life is in the blood, right? Remember I asked the question, you know, outside of the shell, what is life? Yeah, it should be fresh. Okay, absolutely. Okay, so let me, let's do this. The things you do have a very, they play an important role in how you carry out your life. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. The, the very fundamental reasons, right, for why people get into things that they do, whether it be good or bad, right? See, I've said before you today, what? Life and death. The blessing and the curse, right? So choose what? In other words, make good decisions. Right? The tribe of people, right? The Am, Am Yisrael, called by the name of the Most High. Do not cause your mind to turn. Mm -hmm. Right? Don't go into a leprous state of mind. Why? Right. Yeah. Because what is that? That's the opposite of life. Yes. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm looking at several different ways to look at this. Okay. When I see the rod, I see the shepherd's staff. I, I see, I see a, a correction uh, of guidance. Yeah. So when I look at the rod and then I look at the leprosy, I look at a power. Uh, uh, when a man got leprosy, it takes a power to, to straighten that out. I mean, real leprosy, not, not just the stuff that we call, uh, uh, I'm talking about that kind of leprosy that, that leads to death, that kind of turns your hand completely away. And then we look at the blood. So, so you got the power, you got the rod, which is correction, you got the, you got the power, and then you got to bring them out by the blood of the people. So these are signs he's telling them what's going to happen to Miss Ryan. True, no doubt. Okay. But again, what should these things, what message should this convey? Yes, ultimately, these are signs that people are going to know undoubtedly, right, that this is the work of the Most High. Absolutely. But how does it apply to you right now? What's the cultural relevancy of Oh, that's okay. What's the cultural relevancy of what we're reading right now? Have you seen a rod turn into a snake? Have you witnessed someone's flesh going from one color to the exact opposite color? Have you seen water turn to blood? So if I'm trying to get this point across to the Israelite, that is in this diaspora of captivity, mm. what message should they get from that? Just mm. uh, come from the Most High. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I deal with metaphors. That's how I understand things. But I it's like, you know, it's like, but I think that most people do. I think all oh, this could be metaphorical for now. Have I seen a rod turn to a snake? Yeah. I've seen things in order when you take your hand from it to come, you know, every which way and disorderly. Have I seen a heart change? I've seen people be day ones to enemies. Mm -hmm. Have I seen life become death? Yeah, because all that happened to a situation where it's life. We are joined together, we close. We had a situation that was good, we took our hands from it, it became disorderly, <coughs> our hearts changed. Now this relationship, which is life, is now death. Now we got disagreement, we got uh, these separate ways. And that's you just when I was listening to you, you just you actually described something, and you said in relevance to today. If you go away from the instruction, this is the rod, the instruction of the Creator. Mm -hmm. In this instance, Moshe going in to take up, take one as fast, then 
If you go in and you, you, you leave the instruction of the Most High, there will be consequences that can be uh, deadly, gravely. That and, and there, there are consequences. That's, I'm trying to put it together. So, so you, you, that's what I got out of what you just said. That you know, when you go in, I'm leading you. Mm -hmm. Understand that that staff. I'm the most high. Like I'm your staff. You're going in the direction that I'm placing mm -hmm. against aggression. But be careful. Stay the course, or else there are going to be consequences. When you look at the uh, so I, I, well, leprosy, that's something that happens as a result of, of disobedience and not following instructions. There's a, I mean, that's what happened with Mary Ellen. She would she rose up against the one the most high sent. So she had to be made an example of real quick. Like like, look, don't cross this pathway. He works on my behalf. So. I, 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 I tossed that up there. I'm trying to follow you, but um, you, you brought your shovel today, bro. The thing is, is right, the, the rod of correction, right, is supposed, it is, it is intended to affect the inner being. Mm -hmm. okay. You understand what I'm saying? Right. If not, what can happen? You're going to be nah. again. You can go the complete opposite direction. Yeah. Hence, what is that? Anybody with leprosy, what does the Torah say about that? Outside, outside, outside. Outside. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. person is cut off from what? Amongst their people. Right. Amongst their people. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it wasn't, you know, <laughs> this this branch of the, you know, of the family was not in line with the instruction. So when things kind of are not going, if a person says that their life's in shambles, well, why is it? You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> It means that ultimately your life is in balance. There's some things that's not that's not right. You know, everybody follow what I'm saying? So yes, there's a literal concept of what we're reading. But I wasn't there. You understand what I'm saying? I wasn't there. But there's 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 a lot more to get from this passage than what we've talked about in the last three, four years. So like my aunt was saying earlier, the intent of the, uh, the portions every week, right? Let's say you've been doing it for 10 years. You've read through this 10 times, right? Okay. The way you look at this now in year, let's say 20, should not be the same way you looked at it in year one. Ultimately, what you're saying is there's been no, perhaps no growth, no development in how you carry out life. Doing the same thing over and over again, asking the most high, or praying, or making to Philip, saying, I can't understand how the most high is not guiding me. Mm -hmm. This is like this. This is like that. Everybody catching the point mm -hmm. now? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, you know, it's a lot of it can be metaphoric. It can be euphemisms. But we gotta extract that out, extrapolate that out, right? So we get the points, so we know how to walk accordingly. Okay. That makes it. Forgive me, this is my bad ass camera. You don't have to apologize. <laughs> this is what it's for. You know, you good. You good. Um, so when when I look at all three, I I kind of see different ways in which people learn. Every, everybody doesn't learn the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, there we go. We got it. the is for some people to touch. The leprosy is the sign of sin. You understand? And the water being almost in a sense of taste, but that each one gives somebody a little something different in order to grasp home to. Like, so if the rod wasn't enough for you initially, like, for some people, the rod is enough to be like, oh, I'm going to wear the most high. Mm -hmm. You right. understand? And some people needed to see the leprosy. In a sense, you understand? Mm -hmm. And the last one, he had to go to literally to go get his water and see that it was blood to be like, all right, most high man, I can't do nothing because my whole body consists of this water that I need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, um, how I look look at it is like like you said, the rod is the you know the, the tribes or or the correction or the pathway you should be taking. If not, then you have death, which is leprosy, because once you outside the camp from your, your people, it's like death. And when we go to the water and the blood, actually, the water is life and the blood is life. So if I look at like the water, the water is like 80% 80, like 80 of the body and blood with that. So you have life if you, don't, if you, if you follow the rod or 
take the rod of correction, you can have life. So both of them, I'd say that the water and blood is life. Absolutely. And let me, and oh man, so what? Uh, the water, uh, uh, steel water, it don't, it don't move. And if you go up against steel water and move it, then you'll get a smell, which is rotten. And you know, it don't smell good because it's, it's almost dead to the point. That's why, you know, when the most I say he blew the breath of life into you, into your blood or what have you, it's always flowing, it's never steel. Mm. So that's why you have to always have that. The water and the blood is a, is a combination of life. Okay. Everybody good on the point? Okay, you can get the point across. I mean, everybody can say it, brother. I don't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Especially my brother back here. The, 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 the rod, the rod is, is something that we all, because we, we put it to today's time. Y'all say he chastised you because you love him. If you take his corrections, you fall back in line. So the rod, so the rod is what is what supposed to move us, put us back in, in, in the place that we all, at, at, at my age, been, been had that rod put on us. By, by the most high. <laughs> it is not pleasant, trust me. <laughs> leprosy, leprosy, in my eyesight, represents pestilence. Sometimes we use pestilence. Pestilence, when I mean pestilence, I mean diseases and stuff of that nature that comes upon you because you won't take to the rock. So he moves another way to, to, uh, to move you. And, and the blood represents life. Now you can either move to it and he can remove this stuff from you or he can put the blood of your children on the street to help move you in the position that you need. So it either represents life or it represents death. I mean, everybody pretty much say this. Say it. Okay. All right, Shemot, Exodus chapter 4, back at verse 11. Hello, y'all. Hello, y'all. It says, And the Most High said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes dumb, or deaf, or seen, or blind? Is it, I, is it not I, Yahweh? And now go, and I shall be with your mouth and teach you what to say. Which is another example of slow speech. Mm -hmm. Just mean you may not know what to say. You're not good with compilating words or compiling words to relay a message. The most I say, I'll be with your mouth and I'll teach you what to say. Um, but he said, O oh Most High, please send by the hand of him whom you would send. And the displeasure of the Most High burned against Moshe. And he said, Is not Aharon the Lewi your brother? Mm -hmm. I know that he speaks well. Mm. And see, he is also coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he shall be glad in his heart. And you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I am with your mouth and with his mouth. And I shall... Uh, that word is missing. What does it say? Uh, something. Uh, teach you what to do. I believe it's what it says. It's the word mouth. is missing in my script. <laughs> <laughs> I should do it. Uh, your mouth and his mouth. Yeah, and then Psalms. It says, uh, and teach you both. Teach you, as I thought. Okay, my Teach you both what you want to do. Teach you what to do. Mm -hmm. And he shall speak for you to the people, and it shall be that he shall be a mouth for you, and you shall be an Elohim mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. And take this rod in your hand with which you shall do the signs. <coughs> then Moshe went and returned to Yithro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go and return to my brothers, who are in Mitzrayim, to see whether they are still alive. And Yithro said to Moshe, Go in Shalom. And the Most High said to Moshe in Midian, Go, return to Mitzrayim, for all the men are dead who sought your life. So Moshe took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Mitzrayim. And Moshe took the rod of Elohim in his hand. And the Most High said to Moshe, As you go back to Mitzrayim, see that you do all those wonders before Paro, 
which I have put in your hand, but I am going to harden his heart so that he does not let the people go. And you shall say to Paro, Thus saith the Most High, Yisrael is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go to serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, see, I am killing your son, your firstborn. And it came to be on the way in the lodging place that the Most High met him and sought to kill him. And Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and threw it at Moshe's feet and said, You are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. And the Most High said to Aharon, Go to meet Moshe in the wilderness. And he went and met him on the mountain of Elohim and kissed him. Moshe then told Aharon all the words of the Most High, who had sent him, and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moshe went with Aharon and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aharon spoke all the words which Most High had spoken to Moshe. Then he did the signs before the eyes of the people. And the people believed. And they heard that the Most High had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked on their affliction. And they bowed their heads and did obeisance. Shemot chapter 5, verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And afterwards, Moshe and Aharon went in and said to Pharaoh, Thus saith the Most High Elohim of Israel, Let my people go, so that they may keep the festival to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is this Yahweh, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Most High, nor am I going to let Israel go. And they said, the Elohim of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness and slaughter to the Most High Elohim, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the sovereign of Mitzrayim said to them, Moshe and Aharon, why do you take the people uh, from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, See, the people of the land are many. Now and you make them cease from their burdens. And the same day Paro commanded the slave drivers of the people and their foremen, saying, You are no longer to give the people straw to make bricks as before. Let them go gather straw for themselves. And lay on them the required amount of bricks which they made before. Do not diminish it, for they are idle. Uh, that is why they cry out, saying, let us go slaughter to our Elohim. So they lazy for that? <laughs> they lazy. They lazy. They don't want to They don't want to do no work. Shemot chapter 5, verse 9. Let more work be laid on the men, so that they labor in it, and not pay attention to the words of falsehood. And the slave drivers of the people and their foreman went out and spoke to the people, saying, What, what words are they calling? Is he referencing to be false with? Hmm. Hmm. I said lying words. Huh? He's telling them what he's, he's blowing his head up. Or blowing their heads up. They go, oh, the most high is coming to save us. It says, let their work be heavier. Uh, let the work be heavier upon the men. Mm -hmm. Right? And let them engage in it. And let them not pay attention. Uh, to false words. Right. What does that sound like? Ain't no help coming to get you. Get the word. Matter of fact, do more work. You got time. You got that much time to be worried about somebody <coughs> coming to save you. That means that you're not doing enough work. Mm -hmm. So if you got enough time to mm -hmm. listen, mm -hmm. you're not working enough. Yeah. Hence the Shema. Come on now. So Come on. <laughs> Shema Yisrael. Uh huh. No, we don't want to Shema. <laughs> mm -hmm. What we want to do? We just want to do. Work, 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 work
you're not supposed to take care of your family. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. let's not get that misunderstood. Because that's that's where we at. That's what we got to do. But understand that this, the the premise of oppression being overlaid on the people, right? This is a direct interruption of communication, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can't allow you can't allow them to communicate yeah. as they've done in times past. That's what that family is about. Mm -hmm. That family is about communicating with their power, right? So, if we keep on focused on rhyming, or the appearance of rhyming, right? Make them think that all they're here to do is work, 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 work this, work that, go get this, go get that, busy, 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 busy. Where's your focus at? Work. Work. <laughs> right. Or work. Follow what I'm saying? Focused on the wrong thing. Say it again, though. It's it. In Pharaoh's eyes, they focus on the wrong thing. They focus on the wrong thing. Mm. They focus on the wrong power. Mm. Right? Mm. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I got to stop. Uh, I'm going to go back to the circumcision. Okay. Okay, so that tells us that Moshe, who his parents had kept him for three months before he went into the basket. So we know he's circumcised. Say it again. Yeah. Most, Moshe had been kept by his parents three months before they put him in the water, okay. so we know he was circumcised. Right. Okay. But his children were not, right. because he didn't really practice. So we don't know, and the the, the thing that's kind of unique. And, of, and oh, okay. how did this Isha know that she needed to do this? How did that? So again, this kind of goes back to the family that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Remember, I told you Moshe went and he was dealing with some family members. So, circumcision, what family is that in? Mm -hmm. That's an Abraham's family, right? Mm -hmm. So, the notion of circumcising, you know, that's not, that's not foreign. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, now, to say what was on Moshe's mind during that time period, I couldn't tell. I just know that from what we read, his Isha. Uh, was she was on point. <laughs> she did what needed to be done. Because obviously there's some significance to the premise of services. Um, so like, I mean, I can make the conjecture. Right. But it, doesn't, it doesn't really set. Right. The end result is, and here's another thing. The end result is circumcision took place. But you notice, uh, you don't know, you really hear anything about these children anymore. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, I can't see where the Midian had a custom circumcision. I can see in Moshe in the Abraham household there was a custom circumcision. Now, as time progresses along, I can see what happens to us here in the United States. We leave our heritage when you come here and you teach us their heritage. In that thing of circumcision, a lot of us lost. That's why a lot of us have to get circumcised in our older age because it didn't happen when we were as we were supposed to be. So that may be an issue with them there now. She was being born, the children were being born. Well, she may have been circumcised. He's, he's in their land and circumcision may not be an issue at the time. And leaving what 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 made them know that Yah came to kill them, that's not really saying. They say Yah saw to kill them. And they knew whether it was through a vision or whatever, but she recognized it and circumcised his boy. It was it was upset about him because it was something she didn't want to do. Um, at what age was um Ishmael um circumcised? Or wasn't like one of Abraham's sons circumcised at a later age? Yeah. There's, so right, so I feel maybe Moshe felt that he didn't necessarily need to circumcise his sons right away. On the eighth day? But yeah, on the eighth day. So yeah. maybe, like, that's just my conjecture. So maybe he wasn't in a rush, but his Isha knew that, hey, like, you, you put this off for too long. Now the Most High is coming to get you. Okay, cool. Thanks. I wanted to address the, uh, um, the work mentality. Um, my mother-in-law is an advocate of a book called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. I think she made mention of it. Um, 
by Joyce the group. Kang. Kang. Okay. Um, and so, um, listening to what we're talking about, and even that mindset, as you just said, work, 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 it makes me kind of, kind of wonder: Do we need to take the post out? Do we still have slave syndrome, that mentality of work? Because a lot of us. One job is like, that's not enough. I gotta get two jobs, right? It's, the whole essence, like you said, is just to work and work. And as you said a minute ago, yes, we understand we have to provide for our families, but a lot of us are excessive in what it is, the time that we spend mm -hmm. making this money. Mm -hmm. You know, as I just met my mark of 50, I told myself something that I'm actually making manifest right now. I finally um, got myself aligned to move up and my company to do the, um, the the transport truck, which is going to give me more money than what I was making in less time. Okay, okay, a little, a little, a little, a because before it, it, it required me to work almost double the hours it's going to take me to make to make lesser money. That doesn't make any sense. So I'm trying my best to address this slave syndrome because I don't have a desire for my next 50 years. To, to give them all, matter of fact, I'm trying to give them as less as possible and be able to produce prayerfully through this community or communities like this one that want to come together and just create our own case up, our oh, own yeah. bartering oh, system yeah. of survival so we don't have to let them work us for early grade. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, go ahead, brother. Uh, going to the slavery mentality, uh, Pharaoh they said earlier, and Seth Carroll said that they forgot about the bond, the contract that Henry mm -hmm. Joseph had. They said that they would get um, outnumbered. That basically the Israel was outnumbered. Why? It, this is a question for everybody else. If we were going to outnumber them and there were fewer of them, why didn't we overtake them? Same thing as the plantation, you know, they had the white master or whatever, had way more slaves. Mm -hmm. Why was, why didn't we bond together and say, you know what, enough is enough. Let's get back into the evolution. That's a good question. Yeah, a good question. Yeah, yeah. Let's take over what is rightfully ours. You know, like, maybe we did need a sense of direction, you know, from the prophets and so it could be an instructional mouthpiece, but this is just out for discussion. Why didn't we just take out? Like, even now, you know, there's a lot of things behind it, you know. So, uh, I'm gonna tackle this question like this, right? The, uh, the, the notion that we gotta work so much because of, because of the lack of communal community or communal um, support. It comes from, this is my opinion, it comes from our inability, right, to grow in that social factor, okay? So when you go back and you look at the time of Yosef, Yosef established economics, uh, whatever the educational output was, it was unilateral, for the entire edit, as far as what we read of that, that known landmass at that time. Um, the sociology was different. The way people interacted with each other was probably different. Um, and over time, you know, that interaction with people, it was degraded. Uh, somehow or another, kind of like the situation that we're in, uh, we forgot how to intermingle, how to interact with one another, how to become properly educated in the right areas for the right reasons. You understand what I'm saying? The wisdom that Yosef had, it was a sufficient amount of wisdom because it affected public policy. Follow what I'm saying? So whatever the public policy was in Mitch Ryan or whatever the standard law was in Mitch Ryan, it was not only beneficial for Yosef and his family, and the offspring of Yaakov, but it was beneficial for everybody. So it was always something to eat off of from the table. Not to mention, however he was moving, it was beneficial to the king at that time. So we have to 
take, I would say it would be wise for us to take a good look at how the things we do, how they affect the output that kind of projects into society. Because we at a, a disproportionate rate. Uh, I said this last week is that if the Torah is supposed to be the standing law, right? What is that going to look like outside of the walls of the assembly? How does the things that we learn about, that we teach about, how does that affect public policy? How does it affect economics in this communal regime? How does it happen? We have guidelines for how things are supposed to work, right? I mean, that's down to the, okay, well, how do we go about hiring people for a specific job, right? So that they get sufficient revenue to take care of their family, to ensure that nobody's on the outskirts of the community. There's things that's in place for stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? I, and that, my personal opinion is that we haven't yet mastered how to take the concepts of the Torah and make them unilateral to daily living, you know what I'm saying, outside of the Shabbat per se. You understand what I'm saying? So are there enough of us in a position to kind of bring about some of the things that Sar is talking about? If I'm the governor, guess what I get to do? I get to sign how budget is implemented in my state. I sign off on how uh, city code, state code, state ordinance, how things like that are implemented throughout the state. I sign off on how much funding goes into education. Well, what should the education be? There's a lot of different things that, you know, I would say, I got you, sis. I would say that the Torah does teach us. It may not explicitly write it out, but the fundamental concept is very much so there. So, as far as answering the question why, perhaps it was a lost knowledge altogether. Because the Torah is, it's a lot bigger than what we read between the binding of the, of the pages. It's a lot bigger than that. Which it makes sense why we're supposed to be the leaders of the earth. Why? Because the very things that you talk about, that you walk about, that you teach your children, they're good for business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's good for everybody. It's a great benefit to you off the rip. But it's not, not only is it good for you, it's good for everybody. Not kind of the one-sided view that we kind of get in this paradigm where we are. How, you know, it's good, you know, it's good for some people, but it ain't good for everybody. It's all about who you know, not necessarily what you know. When our view is about, you know, the totality of, of people, you know, our people and those who choose to ascribe to a righteous way of living. Follow what I'm saying? We've, we've somehow or another become leprous to that type of understanding. And we own something else all together. So that's how I would answer your question. You know, we've, we've forgotten the basics, the fundamentals of the Torah. The Torah, by all measure, implements growth. It supports okay. upward mobility. Okay. It's not regressive. You can be regressive as an individual, but the Torah is not designed to be regressive. It's designed to promote growth. It's designed to keep life, Absolutely. sustain life, and keep life generational. Thus, you know, we don't, you know, let's say something like, you know, you won't get overtaken by the curses. Instead, you get overtaken by the blessings. That's what we read about in Deuteronomy. If you do what? If you do the customs, right, and guard the judgment. Mm -hmm. So what are the customs? AKA, what's the public policy? And we're gonna put a subcomponent under that, you know. Everybody in here should be smart in some area. If you're good at educating children, right? You can figure out how to do that work. 
how is it good for everybody to keep it rolling? Because check it out. You go overseas, that's this road right here. Everybody follow you in doing some of the weirdest stuff that we do. The line group. Everybody follow you in a lot of the weird things that we do. Everywhere. I've been a lot of places in this world. Yep. So think about if we was doing things according to this. We had business practices like this, like the Torah. Mm -hmm. And guess what? People would they would follow suit. They already do it anyway. So that should be a trigger right there. But the thought is, come let us deal with them wisely, right? So that they forget how to operate like that all together. The plot is making you think what is not. Mm. Yeah. Right. Right. Really? All right, sis. Uh, first and foremost, when we went to Egypt, we were um, guests. We were guests in their house. And they gave us a room that we could stay in. And we multiplied from 70 souls to a cool million. So, eventually, you say, it's my house, I want you to get out too. Now that you're going to work for what you have. Because everything that they were given in the beginning were gifts. And it was based off the, the deal that Yosef had. Yosef has been long gone. They raised generations of people living in another person's place. And so there were no independent thoughts here. That's how they could be so enslaved so easily. You know, um, you feel like you owe them, which they did. You owe them a certain amount. Now they got to a point where nobody even thinks about Yosef, the good that he did, the fact that you're a guest, now you're just imposing. I don't like you, you're here, you, there's too many of y'all. It, it got to be really ugly if, you, if you're on the Egyptian side of things. And this place called Goshen was one of their finest properties. I could just imagine what it looks like now. In my mind, we, we went in. We took it over. We did things. We had, we had, you know, for a person, if you could think about how we are in this day and time, we could turn a two-bedroom apartment into the house for three generations. You just can grab a corner, get a, get a floor, you know, and, and by the time that landlord gets that property back, the structure is just, just broke down. So I can just imagine, as an Egyptian, putting myself in their shoes, what it looked like to see Israelites growing far past capacity in Goshen. And now you're trying to come on over here in the mainland and get what you want and need. And we don't want you here. So I can understand the mentality of the Egyptian. Now think about the mentality of the little people that grew up in Goshen. They don't see nothing but Goshen. They can't see anybody outside of, you know, that's, that's Ramses' place, that's, that's the Egyptian spot, and this is where we belong. We have boxed ourselves in then, and we box ourselves in now. In the Americas and the, the places that we are, it seems as though we feel as though that's all we deserve. That's all we can have. Lesson to our children. But why is it that they're not longing for um, Yisrael? Why are they not longing for Yerushalayim? Why are they not longing for the land? Because we don't teach it to them. We're saying, get that American dream. Get that 401k plan. We're not talking about anything further than that. Mm -hmm. So we need to start the dialogue to take their minds from where, because they can't see anywhere further where their eyes to show them. This is a captivity. When they were there at first, it didn't start out as captivity. It turned into a captivity because we never elevated our minds from just being Goshenites. We couldn't see past Goshen. So the father heard their cries because they realized, he realized, oh, well, they finally getting tired of that crap space. So you really ready? I was waiting for you the whole time. So, and it's the same thing until they started revolting in this uh, uh, new age of uh, the, the diaspora of a captivity. They, they just took it until somebody got brave enough to say, you know, this is not righteous. So until we 
decide. And then the, you know how your baby cries and you feel like, oh man, this is not just a regular whining or whimpering. This is something very wrong. Until we realize that something is really wrong with our situation and cry out to the Creator, He's going to let us continue doing what we do. But you have to understand the miracle in it. He's growing us. He's growing us. He's growing us so that, I mean, because we strengthen numbers, right? Even evil people are strengthened by their numbers. You know, somebody come out and say, yeah, we heard everybody black. And it's like 500 of them and the crowd grows. And you'll see 5,000 people start screaming, oh, I hate black people. Because they got strength with them. They got numbers. So we have to really, first of all, it's, that's, that's an illusion. Your strength comes from the almighty. And once we start to realize we're better than just being slaves or better than just living in somebody else's house, and we're going to get our own. Yeah. Uh, uh, I want to say, uh, Maureen, what you said, you know, it really, 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 really makes sense to me. Um, I mean, it's crazy because, like, you think about, like, the Jewish community and how mm -hmm. they are like prospering and how they make sure that their children go to school and they make sure that their children become the doctors mm -hmm. and the lawyers and they make sure that their children learn all these things so they can put them in all these different places and they have their communities and they have their stores and they have mm -hmm. their schools. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they are setting their self up for, you know, the return. Mm -hmm. But what are we doing? We're Oh, but we're in captivity, but we just wait for the most time. No, we need to start making our children do those things. Like, we need to stop giving choices and saying, okay, exactly. this from the beginning, from exactly. when they are young, this is what you're gonna do. Exactly. Okay, when well, you're, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your characteristics, you're good at this, all right, from when they're young, put an electricity book in front of them, boom. Put that anatomy book in front of this one. All right, this is what you're gonna do. I think that's very important. And you know, what you said, that really just like clicked something in my brain. Like I never really thought about that. And then like, I listen to so many people always talk about uh, how, you know, they're just ready to just be on their own and this and that. And a lot of black people just don't. How many black people actually know how to go out there and farm and hunt and do the things that we need to be able to do to survive? Like, it's very important that we need to learn all of these different kind of skills. And maybe that may be a reason why the Most High has not gathered us together yet, because we're not doing what we need to do to learn all of these skills and things that we need to have our own. Shabbat Shalom to have our own the way that we should. And I never really looked at it that way, but now, you know, I'm, I'm seeing it a totally different way now. I got a question after you all say what she has to say. To me, it seems more like, more like childbirth. When he took them, when he, he told Moses, he told Moshe, that they were going into Canaan, the land of the Canaanites and the, and the Hittites and the Amorites, et cetera, et cetera. So they were placed there during a famine to survive, to grow, to multiply, to get big, to get too big for where they were. And that's the same thing that happens with childbirth. Seed gets planted, baby grows, you get bigger than you thought you could possibly get, and then you go into stress mode, and some squishing start happening. And <laughs> yeah, memory. Um, so they it get it gets difficult, and until it gets difficult enough, the baby stays where it is. That's That's exactly. And so it it was almost like giving birth, coming out of Mitzrayim, it was basically the birth of the nation. They're going into their own place. It's just like they're taken out there, they're taught what they're supposed to do, just like you do a child. These are the rules. This is what we're going to do when we go into our new house. So Pharaoh, the new Pharaoh, 
Something had to drive them out of this run. So if they remain there comfortably, we'd be still in this run. So now, here we are in the diaspora, trying to learn what we're supposed to do so we can do what we're supposed to, so we can give birth again and go back to the land. So, <clears throat> y'all know that, uh, so like it, throughout our captivity, right, everybody didn't always go back to the land. Right. Everybody knows that. Right? Mm -hmm. right. Everybody didn't always go back to the land. So, the point, the his, his, I would submit this as a point of consideration. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm gonna ask this. I'm gonna ask this question again. If this is going, to be, if the Torah, right, is going to be, you know, come a time when no man is gonna have to teach another man about the Torah because the Most High said he's going to put it place in where? In our heart. What is that going to look like? You understand what I'm saying? Think about it. Mm -hmm. The Torah is what? What does it mean? It just means instructions, right? Mm -hmm. Everything in the edicts is governed by what? Instructions. instructions. You know, uh, apple tree, you got to grow like this. If you kind of grow like this, you know, some things might be wrong. Right. Grass, I like for you to be green. If you're brown, something ain't right. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's like, the, the one thing I think we should consider, right? If Israel is that big, right? And we know Israel is that big, you know, conclusively, right? What should we be learning? What does the what is the learning supposed to look like? Okay, yeah, we supposed to turn we supposed to learn Torah. Okay, define that to me. It's just a whole thing. Is this rhetorical or is this? It's just something for you to think about. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Define what learning the Torah is supposed to be. You mean you know, I don't know, but I don't reckon that we gonna be you know, when that time comes and he's just going to be in front of people <coughs> like this, reading from a book, will be examples. Was not Abraham, was he a walking talker? Okay. Well, what, all, what did he do? Man, you'd be like Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Abraham was distinguished <coughs> in all his travels. Was he not? Okay. Most High said, as far as your eyes can see, all this belongs to you and your seed. Right? So, again, how are we approaching the Torah?